नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस्स so today we are going to begin the new part part 4 of the book 4 of the buddha and his dhamma and uh, uh, this part uh, i am going to uh, offer a brief commentary on the various uh, sections of it before we proceed on to study the individual uh, sections so as we have seen that baba sahib ambedkar's uh, 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 intention and attitude was to present the buddha's teachings in such a way that uh, it will be easy for us to understand and we have seen baba sahib's efforts in making things easy for us and uh, <clears throat> more or less we have covered a lot of ground in terms of uh, the basic teachings of the buddha by basic here doesn't mean that you know something rudimentary basic means foundational base and uh, unless we understand the basic or essential or fundamental teachings of the buddha it's very difficult to make sense of the entire uh, scheme of practice and teaching of the buddha and uh, so far as this buddha and dhamma is concerned we have seen how baba sahib ambedkar has beautifully laid out the various uh, teachings i find uh, this section is very important uh, because uh, Uh, as we can see the uh, part 4 of the book 4 is titled as his sermons so uh, we have seen lot of the buddha's teachings so far but in this in this in this part 4 we are going to look at what is what baba sahib ambedkar termed as the buddha's sermons and baba sahib ambedkar has divided the entire uh, uh, part 4 into uh, six sections and uh, the section 1 is of course on the sermons for householders and uh, sermons on the need for maintaining character sermons on righteousness sermons on nibbana sermons on dhamma and sermons on socio political questions so you see even the scheme of dividing the buddha's uh, you know teachings into this uh, sort of uh, Uh, sermons you know they are not limited to uh, the entire tripitaka but we can see in our own ways as to this classification you know of you know offers us a kind of uh, a tool to uh, think about the buddha buddha sermons in a very systematic way and i think the beauty of the buddha and dhamma is the way baba sahib ambedkar has tried to categorize the uh, various teachings of the buddha so that we can understand the teachings of the buddha in the context of of the of the categories that baba sahib ambedkar has created and by that way we can understand and appreciate the entire spectrum or gamut of the buddha's teachings so for example you know the sermons for householders you know so we 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 have seen that in the classical buddhism the approach has been always to address the monks and the nuns but here you know we see that uh, as baba sahib ambedkar uh, has 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 offered to the buddhist revival is the is to make buddhism for all you know not just for the monks or the nuns or for for the people who have taken what is called the sangha diksha but the buddhism is is for everybody wherever there is a humanity wherever there is a human being the buddhism is for everybody and this particular title sermons for householders communicates that you know the buddha has given a wide range of sermons for the householders then serv- sermons on the need for maintaining character we have seen that this theme of character this theme of of taking responsibility the theme of following a ethical system an ethical system is running throughout the buddha nizam isn't it so the second section is is devoted to sermons on the need for maintaining character the third sermons on righteousness and we have seen that how uh, in the buddha scheme of teachings the righteousness is important it's essential part of buddhism you know we have even seen that one of the goals of the dhamma is to create the kingdom of righteousness and the section 4 is on sermons on nibbana because you know 
the Buddha, as Baba Sambhat says that Nibbana is a very important teaching of the Buddha. It is not some kind of a metaphysical realm that the Buddha has been talking about. When Buddha talks about Nibbana, he talks in a very, uh, you know, you know, in a, in, a, in a humanistic manner, in a psychological manner as to what Nibbana constitute of instead of, you know, uh, uh, making people lose their minds into some kind of a, of a realm, which is metaphysical, isn't it? So I think this is very important categorization, sermons on Nibbana and of course sermons on Dhamma itself. So the Buddha has given the sermons on Dhamma. And then final section is about sermons on socio-political questions, isn't it? As we have seen that unless we present the Buddha's teachings uh, in, a, in a context of socio-social political, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 you know, it's going to be, get confined to a narrow circles of, of a few people. And therefore, I think the section six, which is titled as sermons on socio-political questions is altogether important from the context of the Buddha's teaching. So having uh, elucidated the entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, part four of the book, four of the Buddha is the monarch. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go through this uh, 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 sections. Uh, we will not go at length. I'm not going to read the uh, sections as we have done in the in the in the previous uh, sessions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the essential points included in the sermons in this in this in the Buddha sermons. So, for example, let's take now let's begin with section one, which is titled as sermons for householders. And there are three subsections in the section one. The subsection one is titled as the happy householder. Isn't it? The very word happy householder communicates something very important that the Buddha has, has given emphasis on, on, on how every human being, you know, needs to be happy. Why, you know, what makes a householder happy? The second is daughter may be better than a son. Isn't it? Now, this is very radical teaching of the Buddha. When at the time in India, when the women and the girl child were looked down, looked down and you know they were not given the status in the society even today such is the case in India if you look at the uh, female infanticide the cases of female infanticide you know the, uh, the 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 sex determination tests and so on and so forth we see that even today the uh, girls or the daughters are considered to be inferior to the male child and uh, uh, we have we we know that this is embedded even today in the Indian culture to degrade the women in terms of you know even killing the uh, daughters and you know that has created a disproportionate sex ratio so you see daughter daughter may be better than a son is a very important title in itself and you know that communicates something about that the, the society of that time and even the society of today this is very important and and i think uh, very essential to include this uh, in the sermons for householders and the third, of course, is about the family, is about the relationship between husband and wife. And uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, we have seen in the world, in around our world, in our personal relationship, and in the, all over the places we have seen that, you know, this, this is a basic sort of a unit, unit in, the, in, the, in the society. This society begins with family and the family extended to the society and the country and so on and so forth. So to include the sermons on husband and wife is very important for the for the buddha's teachings for the householders and i think this is very crucial because because this is very contemporary as well we as we have seen so much of conflict because of this in the in the families and if, the, if there is a conflict in the family there is a conflict in the society there is a conflict in the nation and considering you know the family as a basic uh, unit of the society to include the sermons on on you know husband and wife is very important and i think i think that takes us to a very important sort of a discussion you know happy householder in terms of in terms of uh, you know uh, we are going to look into that as to how and how buddha taught about it and in terms of the gender you know the gender parity that the buddha talked about and in the end the parity between the husband and wife which is very crucial and essential for for a harmonious family and went by that way harmonious society. So let's begin with the sermons for householders. Who is the happy householder? So once Anath Pindaka went to the Buddha and he was very anxious to know how 
you know, uh, how where in lies the happiness of householder. And this is a secret for a happiness of householder, which we have to bear in mind. What is the first secret? You see, the happiness of possession. Now, if you look at the classical Buddhism, the Buddha talks about detachment. The Buddha talk, talked about letting go. The Buddha talked about, you know, uh, not getting attached to anything. And so what is it the Buddha talking about here? That Buddha is talking about the happiness of possession. And, you know, this, this seems like contradictory that the Buddha talked about giving up everything, you know. But as Baba Sambedkar has proved, the Buddha never extolled, the Buddha never glorified, the Buddha never ennobled the poverty. Because the poverty can be, can, can, can lead to the great amount of suffering. Isn't it? So, this is a very revolutionary point, I would say, that the Buddha here is teaching Anatta Pindaka, one of the greatest businessmen, one of the biggest businessmen of the time in India. To him, to Anatta Pindaka, the Buddha is saying that the happiness of a householder lies in possession. Means, in, in, in other words, the, the householders are happy if they have wealth. So, the wealth brings happiness for a householder. Isn't it? So, the Buddha is not ennobling the poverty. And this is a very important point. As we have seen that the Buddhism is ridden with the what is called the poverty thinking. You know, it's not the, the, the thinking of, 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 of living everything and living a life of a monk. You know, the word monk is not a Buddhist word. It's an English word. The proper word for a bhikkhu for this uh, monk in, 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 the, in, the, in the Buddhist language is bhikkhu or bhikshu. And bhikshu means sharer, one who shares with all the humanity. And I think if we bear in this mind the word sharer, then what does the uh, monk has to share with others? You know, it is the truth. It is the dhamma that the monk has to, the bhikshu has to share with others. You know, so you see uh, this, this, this presentation of, of, of the teachings of the Buddha in, in terms of uh, the householder's happiness lies in possession is very important. So whoever we are, if we are living a domesticate life or we are living the life of a householder, it is important to earn wealth. But how does one earn the wealth? Justly and righteously. You know, so the Buddha is saying that you, you should earn the money. You should have the wealth earned justly and righteously. Acquired by great industry. That means we have to have, be very industrious. We have to be very active. Earning wealth is not an easy job. For that, we have to strive very hard. Amassed by strength of the arm, by the sweat of one's bro, and earned by sweat of the bro. At the thought, I am possessed of wealth, justly gained, he gains happiness. It's a very beautiful point. You know, so if there is a householder, if he has gained the way, uh, you know, wealth by, by just means, by the rightful means, by working hard, and when he has acquired the wealth in this way, the uh, then the householder thinks, I am purchased of wealth, justly gained. He gains happiness. Very important point. You know, we have to underline it that as a householder, we have to earn the wealth. The second is the happiness of enjoyment. What is the happiness of enjoyment? A householder is possessed of wealth, justly and righteously acquired by great industry, amassed by the strength of the arm and earned by the sweat of the bro, enjoys his wealth and performs acts of merit. So how do we enjoy our wealth? You know, that's also very important. You know, purchasing the wealth, earning the wealth is important. One point. The second point, as we can see, is to perform acts of merit. You know, in other words, do the dana, do the charity, do the acts of merit. And thus at the thought, I am doing meritorious deeds with my wealth, which was justly gained and so forth. He gains happiness. So the second way by which a householder gets happiness is by sharing his wealth, by making meritorious deeds. And, you know, that brings a lot of happiness to the householder. The third is the happiness of freedom from debt, isn't it? 
in some of the uh, buddhist uh, sutras when the buddha is talking about the nirvana how how one feels about nirvana the one of the uh, images that has been given by the buddha is the free from death so you see if we are if we if we are ridden by the debt if we have borrowed a lot of money from others if we are ridden by the debt then you know that is the cause of have you know suffering we suffer and uh, freedom from debt is a very important thing you know we cannot be indebted to anybody so if we earn the wealth rightfully justly and you know by working hard and if we share that wealth with others and do the meritorious things we get happiness and the third thing because we are free from any debt uh, if a householder or anybody is under debt that person is not happy they cannot be happy so third is the happiness of freedom from debt a householder owes no one any debt great or small thus he gains happiness thus he at the thought of i owe no man anything and so forth gains happiness you see imagine that we are not owing anything to anybody we are not under debt is such a you know such a path to feel the happiness i owe no man anything you know i have, i don't owe anything to any man isn't it i am free from the debt so that kind of a feeling is you know uh, you know conducive to happiness fourth is the happiness of blamelessness a householder who is endowed with blameless action of body blameless speech and blameless thinking gains happiness of blamelessness you know so if if the householder is blameless you know in terms of his bodily action in terms of his speech in terms of his thinking kaya vacha mana you know this blamelessness leads to happiness of blamelessness so you see there are there are a four kind of happiness that the buddha has talked about here the happiness of having wealth one the happiness of of have of of having able to share that wealth with others through the meritorious deeds the happiness of being free from the debt and the happiness of blamelessness you know there is a lot where we can we can we can we can take from there in this in this sermons from for householder the subsection 1 the happiness of householder i think we can take a lot from this section for our own lives you know in other words the buddha is asking us to be industrious the buddha is asking us to work hard to earn money and the buddha is asking us to share whatever we earn with others and not only share but you know you yourself be free from the debt and you know live a life of blamelessness so is it this this four categorization of the happiness of householder very important categorization i would say so looking at you know the financial uh, you know uh, the buddha's uh, sermons on on wealth and finance we can take this as a standardized statement of the buddha on on acquiring wealth on sharing wealth on living a life free from the debt and on 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 being blameless so see uh, if we if we if we borrow this uh, framework to live a life we can we can live a very happy life isn't it because most of the times some people are trying to make wealth by the by the unjust means by exploiting others by 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 exploiting the nature by exploiting anything by corrupt ways and that is not the way to happiness and and therefore every single word if we if we if we decipher the code that is underlying here is the buddha's encouragement of creating the wealth of sharing the wealth of 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 you know uh, uh of, of of being free from the debt and not to live a life which is a life of a blame you know blameful life so having having looked at this first uh, subsection i'm going to look at the second subsection the daughter may be better than a son so you know this this is a very important theme that we have seen in in our country particularly a female infanticide is you know takes place in a in a in a in a, in a large numbers and we have we have seen we know that the sex ratio is so adverse in our country and it's you know disproportionate numbers of uh, women uh, to the men uh, and we have seen that if there is a, is a sort of a crisis in the north india in terms of you know the f- uh, female uh, infants are killed uh, because the women are considered low in the in the society and in the culture and i think this sermon is very important and we should promote this sermon you know as much as we can so here there is a conversation between uh, 
between the king Prasenajit and uh, and uh, the, the Buddha, where the Prasenadi or Prasenajit goes to the Buddha, and you know they are talking, and then uh, a person comes and 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 privately tells to the king some news, and the king is not happy. The king is sad. He is depressed. And the Buddha asked him why is he is depressed, and he breaks the news saying that. Queen Mallika, who was a great supporter of the Buddha, she supported the Buddha's Sangha like anything, had given birth to a daughter. So he's sad. Prasenajit is sad because, you know, the daughter is born in his, in his family and he's, of course, not happy with that. So thereupon the exalted one, the Buddha, discerning the matter, said, A woman child, O lord of men, may prove even a better offspring than a male. For she may grow up wise and virtuous. Her husband's mother reverencing true wife, a daughter. Isn't it? See this, this scheme of, of wife, daughter and uh, wife, daughter uh, is very important because, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the traditional uh, uh, so-called society imbued with the values of Manu, the, uh, it, the, 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 the uh, women is only reduced to the roles of a wife, a daughter, and, you know, somebody who has to be looked after all the time, you know, she's a weaker sex in the scheme of the Manu and she has to be looked up all the time. She has to be protected all the time. That's what is there in the society. But uh, here, you know, we see that uh, the, the Buddha has extolled the birth of women, you know, it's, it's, and we have seen in the, in the, in the various writings of Baba Sambedkar, particularly, I would, you know, request all of you, to, if you get time, to go through Baba Sahib's classical paper on the rise and fall of Hindu, Hindu women and who is responsible for it. And there, the, there uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar has gone into the, 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 uh, the Buddhist Tripitaka and, you know, he has, uh, you know, constructed the, 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 the Buddhist uh, sort of uh, tools for the emancipation of the society in terms of the emancipation of the women. And uh, in, 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 in one of the aphorisms that Baba Sambhika says that I measure the progress of the society by the progress made by the women in that society. And, you know, if we connect all the uh, movements of Baba Sambhika right from the Hindu code bill and, you know, the defense of the Buddha uh, for, as, the, as the liberator of the women and, you know, the, the Buddhist Sangha of, of the Bhikshuni Sangha itself is an example of of the of the abode of freedom for all the women, you know, there were a lot of women who were who were who had who were who had suffered a lot. They had lost their children. They had lost their husbands. They were alone. And the Buddhist Bhikshuni Sangha offered a place of refuge or abode to all these women. So you see, you know, this is a very important thinking that we need to develop. And uh, the verse number six: the boy that she may bear may do great deeds and rule. Great realms, yeah, such a son of a noble wife becomes his country's guide. Isn't it? So you see, uh, even if there is a son, you know, even if they are the emperors, you know, they are ultimately to be to be born from the wombs of their mothers. Isn't it? So, you know, this male chauvinism or, or, or claiming that the men are supreme, you know, is being challenged by the Buddha because everybody has to be born of a woman. Isn't it? So I think this, this is very important because in the family, to earn wealth, you know, not to uh, discriminate between a boy and a girl, doesn't matter whether there is a boy or a girl, very important for the householder to be happy. The third is a very important topic that we need to look into. And uh, it's about the husband and wife, you know, in terms of the relationship, we have seen that in the societies around us, there is a lot of... Uh, you know, things happening in terms of, you know, not knowing uh, the uh, the proper way by which husband and wife should relate to each other. And, you know, there are, of course, a lot of things that cause conflicts uh, between the between the man and a woman. You know, there are many, many things. But here, the Buddha has categorically uh, talked about, uh, you know, how uh, the uh, relationship between the husband and wife can be based on and what is the criteria for that. So the uh, subsection three is titled as husband and wife. So this is the gradually from wealth, uh, children and husband and wife, isn't it? The whole unit of family. 
And, uh, you know, we have to look into these uh, teachings very carefully in, in the present context because, because the Buddhism was uh, never considered when in the classical time it might be, but, you know, the Buddhism is also the religion of the families. It's not just the teachings for the monks and nuns. It, you know, it is, it is also for the families. And one of the reasons that the Buddhism declined is the 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 only the Buddhist Buddhist Sangha had uh, you know as a as a treasurer or repository of the Buddha's teachings. When it died, the Buddha Buddhism disappeared from this country, isn't it? That's why for the survival of Buddhism, it's very important that the Buddhism enters into family. The Buddhism now uh, begin to uh, you know uh, become the basis of the family. It is very important, isn't it? So. That's how the survival of the Brahminism took place, family after family. If the if the if the if the if the father is a Brahmin, the son is a Brahmin, you know, you don't need uh, you know any system to survive. And uh, in Japan and in Korea, there are some innovations where the monks are married, you know, and they run the family temples. And and you know, it, there might be some merits or demerits of the system, but now in the present times, we have to take this thing into consideration as to Buddhism can how Buddhism can be integrated with the families, with the, with, the, with the family as a unit of a society. And I think that's a bigger question, which we might need to tackle at some other point. But here suffice is to say that the Buddha has talked about the relationship between the husband and wife. By that way, the Buddha has talked about the family as a unit. By that way, the Buddha has talked about the non-discrimination between them, between the female and the man infant. By that way, the Buddha has talked about the supremacy or the primacy of earning wealth, of sharing the wealth. You see, all these things tie together. So let me look at the key points here. The Buddha has uh, talked about, when he talked about husband and wife in terms of the, of, 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 of what is called the uh, four ways for a husband and wife of living together. Isn't it? It's very important. The Buddha, Buddha is very clear. He's very, you know, sharp. The Buddha is very categorical. Isn't it? He, he doesn't mean the word, you know. His teachings are very clear. He talks about there are four ways for a husband and wife of living together. Isn't it? So uh, what is the right relationship between the husband and wife to the householder and their wife? So seated, the exalted one spec. Thus, householders, there are four ways for a husband and wife of living together. Isn't it? A wild man lives with a wild woman. A wild man lives with a goddess. A god lives with a wild woman and a god lives with a goddess. Isn't it? See, some of, sometimes some of the things we we have, we, we don't know because there can be a lot of issues in terms of, uh, you know, family between the relation between man and women. But what the Buddha is talking about are the things in general as to what can be the basis of a man and a woman, you know, living together. So, the first pair is a wild man lives with a wild woman. Isn't it? The evil man lives with the evil women. How is that? Householder. A husband kills, steals, commits impurity, lies and indulges in fermented liquor. Five precepts. The five precepts are going to come again and again and again. Because, you know, they are like the pointers to the, to the truth. They are they are the embodiments embodiment of the Buddha's mind, isn't it? So the five precepts are going to come again and again, isn't it? So here a husband kills, steals, commits impurity, lies, and indulges in fermented liquor. Secondly, is wicked and sinful. Thirdly, with his heart possessed by avarice, he lives the life of a householder and abuses and reviles virtuous people. Isn't it? So, besides Panchashil, the second uh, sort of, uh, you know, wise is he is being wicked and sinful. With his heart possessed by avarice, he is so greedy. The man is so greedy. He lives the life of a householder and abuses and reviles virtuous people. And what happens to his wife? Also, his wife kills Stills commits impurity, lies and indulges in fermented liquor, is wicked and sinful. With her heart purchased by avarice, she lives the life of the family and abuses and reviles the virtuous people. Thus, indeed, householder, a wild man lives with a wild woman. 
a devil is living with a devil isn't it so you know this sort of a relationship where both are evil in terms of uh, vices that they both have they don't practice five precepts they are full of uh, wickedness they are sinful you know their hearts are purchased by avarice and you know they blame other people abuse the virtuous people you see very important this is very important categorization so that's the first pair the second is what is the second one a wild man lives with a goddess so what is the wild wild man does does a husband kills steals commits impurity lies and indulges in fermented liquor is wicked and sinful with his heart possessed by avarice he lives the life of a householder and abuses and revolts virtuous people but his wife abstains from killing thieving sexual impurity lying and indulges indulges in forward liquor his wife is virtuous and of good behavior with her heart freed from the taint of avarice she lives the family life and abuses not not revolts virtuous people thus indeed householder a wild man lives with a goddess secondly the uh, a god lives with a wild woman householders a husband abstains from killing thieving impurity lying and indulge in fermented liquor is virtuous and of good behavior with his mind freed from the stains of avarice he lives the family life and abuses not nor revolts virtuous people but his wife kills steals commits impurity lies and indulges in the fermented liquor is wicked and sinful with a heart possessed by avarice she lives the family life and abuses and revolts virtuous people thus indeed householder a god lives with a wild woman so the three pairs that we have seen and the final pair that the buddha is talking about is householders here in a husband and a wife both both ek do pani ka okay the 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 fourth pair is you know householder here in a husband and a wife both abstain from killing thieving impurity lying and indulges indulges in fermented liquor no indulgence for wanted liquor are virtuous and of good behavior with mind freed from taints of avarice they live their family life and have not nor revive virtuous people thus indeed householders a god lives with a goddess this is the fourth pair so you know the the, the, the buddha in a way describe the 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 four ways by which a husband relates with his wife and the wife uh, you know uh, relates with his husband that's why to put that otherwise only so we see uh, this is a very important uh, structure that we can see here in terms of uh, the relationship between husband and wife so you see all these subsections of the section uh, the happy householder we can see very clearly as to how the buddha taught to the householders in terms of how they can live the happy life how they can live a life which is which is not discriminatory life between a man you know between a, a female and a male child and how they both can relate with each other in terms of 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 their relation you see in in other words what buddha is saying that if there is a dhamma in in the in the family if there is the rightful way of earning money if there is a family which doesn't discriminate between the man and um, women then we see that you know that is we can say the ideal buddhist family and i think the theme of ideal buddhist family has to be now talked about you know and uh, promoted as what constitute uh, 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 what is called the happy fam- happy buddhist family because i think the time has come now for for for, for the people uh, for the buddhist to you know make sense of the buddha's teachings in in all the context and the family being the basic unit of the society and it's never going to go out of fashion isn't it so you know when the man and women relate with each other on what basis they relate with each other you know if they bear the children on what basis they relate with their children and how do they bring their family so i think these three strands that is uh, you know that the buddha has unraveled for the family of uh, you know to make the families happy are i think very important and uh, i would stop here and i would open up the class for any discussion any comments from any of you anything
what do you think about you know the, you know buddhism being considered as a monastic sort of a religion and uh, baba sahib ambedkar has 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 been always a promoter of what is called the humanistic buddhism he has in one letter he has talked about the humanistic buddhism and uh, i think that's a very important concept as to how buddhism is not just for the monks and nuns as a it's for the human beings and this is the theme that is underlying in all the writings and speeches of baba sahib ambedkar in 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 in, uh, in in terms of uh, his take on the various teachings of the buddha and uh, you know what do you think about family being becoming the unit you know of 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 living a buddhist life isn't it is it contradictory that you know living a monastic life and living a family life are they contradictory you know is it possible because at the time of the buddha there were many uh, householders who has attained to the fruits of nibbana there were many 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 anath pindaka himself is the case in point you know he was he attained to the uh, you know the, the the fruits of uh, awakening and there are there are many many people yeah, as we can see even pasinnad ji or even 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 ajay shatru was taught in a way uh, even after committing fratricide and uh, there are a lot of people you know in the buddhist texts in mahayana context there are many householders one of the famous classical case of a householder who, who was very prominent sort of a figure in the buddhist world in he was from he was he belonged to the lichavi clan lived in vaisali vimalakirti you know his his his, his sutra is so popular in, in in china and japan it is considered to be the ideal householder you know he challenged sariputra he challenged mahamoggala in, in that sutra a very beautiful sutra to read uh, vimalakirti sutra so you know what do you think about about this this section on sarmans for householders Javeem sir, Gash. Yeah. Uh, this uh, for your question, this is very clear. Okay. Gash, there is some problem with your mic. Uh, this is not clear. Oh, okay, you hello. speak out. Speak, speak. Please speak. Yes. What I am saying from your question, it is clear. Yeah, my voice is there. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's like breaking. There is some noise, but you can, you can, you can speak. I will come back. I will come back. Otherwise, if someone has no, no, no. Please go on. Please go on. Is okay. Yeah. From from uh, your question, it is and uh, what is what appeals me is like Buddhism is so modern, and it is more for uh, uh, normal people also. I Means a family life. It is giving a different dimension. Now, who doesn't want the happiness of possession, happiness of enjoyment, and happiness of being. Do uh, be or happiness of doing something good in the society and getting recognition from this. But if the things are done within the Buddhist dimension, that means uh, with with uh, you know awake mind and uh, uh, with the uh, with the moral order, then uh, then it has different meaning at all to your earnings. Mm -hmm. I really like this dimension and what Dr. Baba Sir Baba Sir brought here. Uh, he's saying, he's saying a daughter is talking about a daughter may be better than a son because she has ability to produce another life. Uh, it is so modern, no? Yes. Really, and then the, then the then the types of relationship between husband and wife or the type of uh, people. What can be a couple? Yeah. Really interesting. Really interesting. And this is what actually is is today also. There is no other classification or no other hmm. uh, no other categorization possible nowadays. Also. It's really modern. Thank you, thank you, sir. Welcome. Anyone? Sir, I think uh, uh, the the chapter itself is, is a manual for the uh, uh, family. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, it gives uh, uh, only not only gives the guidelines uh, to create happiness and to sustain as well mm -hmm. Means, right, right. Uh, for each and every person in the family the responsibility has been given over here. Mm -hmm. and all have to follow those paths and uh, can achieve what's the uh, humans uh, uh, desirest uh, 
a way to live a happy life. Mm -hmm. You have very well said that uh, Baba Sahib has uh, 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 created uh, um, uh, small monasteries, uh, uh, not only for the monks, or for the families also. <laughs> very beautifully put. The family has a monastery. Very beautifully put. Pumesh. Yeah, please go on. Say more. It's okay. Yeah. Such, such, such things... Uh, when we enlightened with uh, such phrases, mm -hmm. then it, it gives us a, a, a not insight but a motivation to follow those. Mm -hmm. Means what we are doing today, we, we are just uh, in a trap. Mm -hmm. By reading all these uh, 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 philosophies and uh, all these uh, beautiful phrases, it mm -hmm. gives uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. And what what the monastery? They are lighthouses. Mm -hmm. Similar, we are bringing light to our families. We are bringing light to our houses. Beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. Very beautiful, Umesh. Nicely put. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? See, as uh, I often say that when the Buddha and his Dhamma is a text that is multi-layered and multi-dimension and, you know, uh, we, when we advance ahead in reading, we also come back to the previous sections and we, we find this very beautiful interconnections between a lot of different sections and, you know, in a way we, we try to understand the mind of the, of the Baba Sahib Ambedkar uh, you know, as to how he looked at Buddhism and I think this understanding is very crucial for 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 the buddhist movement in india and that's why my encouragement is always to read the buddha and his dhamma you know make sense of the different sections try to interconnect interrelate various sections so you see if we if we if we begin to look now this particular section in terms of the entire uh, gamut of uh, text that baba sambedkar has written you know a lot of things starts making sense as to you know as to how the families can become the unit of happiness itself, you know. And it's a very simple idea that five precepts not being greedy. Very simple. It looks very simple. And all the time, you know, when we when we study like that, we begin to see the primacy of the five precepts. So, you know, they are not just something to be recited again and again in the ritualistic manner. Of course, it is very important uh, to utter them in a ritualistic manner, even to chant them daily, you know. The Panchashila has to be chanted daily. The three refuges has to be chanted in daily, you know. That's very important because we, in a way, we understand what is important for us in our lives. But also putting them in practice in the family context, in any context, is so important. Even in the context of earning money, if somebody is committed to five precepts, you know, there are some examples where the people have earned money by, by sticking to the five precepts. Isn't it? So, you know, it is not that, uh, you know, the Buddhism becomes just a sort of a recitation or, you know, something ritualistic. But, you know, this, this, this teaching starts making sense in, in, in various spheres of our lives if we, if we really, you know, try to put them in practice. So, in the context of a family life, I think some of uh, us need to develop the, the concept of Buddhism for families, you know. And it's very important that, as Umesh has said, that the families become unit of Buddhism itself. Of propagation of Buddhism, of, of embodying the values taught by the Buddha, by by you know the way Baba Sambedkar has presented it, not not discarding uh, the families, not undermining the families as a unit of a society, and this is I think very crucial for us to understand because in the Buddhist history you will see that uh, like if you go to Sanchi for example, or if you go to any Buddhist. Uh, place uh, of antiquity, you will see that the huge donations have been made by the women. In the name of a women, there are a lot of donations made to this various, various monasteries and various, uh, this thing. You know, if you look into the history, the Buddha was the first person in the history of the world who opened the door of, of, you know, enlightenment for the women. Isn't it? He was the first to form the community of the women who were practicing uh, you know, practicing to become liberated. The Thiri Gatha, 
if some of you might have heard about it, Theri Gatha is considered to be the first book of anthology, anthology of the women's women's poetry. Isn't it? So you see, as Pankaj said, that the Buddhism is very modern. You know, it is not something antique. It is not something out of time and out of place. If we understand the way Baba Sahib did understand the teachings of the Buddha, we can see that the Buddhism is applicable everywhere. In families, in society, in politics, in, in all the spheres of human experiences. And this is what is critical and important about, uh, about reading the Buddha Nizamma. You know, making it up to date, bringing it as a live sort of a... a you know, the philosophy is not a proper word, but as a live way of life, as we have seen in the previous sections, you know, Buddhist way of life. So, uh, this is the work of innovation. This is the work of, of making Buddhism uh, become uh, an active force in the world, beginning with the families. True, sir. True. <laughs> Shasha? Uh, Jaibim, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I would like to give uh, one of my, I would like to share one of my experience uh, during the COVID time when everybody got locked out and uh, everybody got isolated. So everybody got trapped in fear, trapped in uh, a lot of anxiety. But I, I really like, you know, thought that what if like, uh, if I sit together with my family, so to get, sit together with my mom and my sister every day, and chant five minutes, um, three saran and panchashil, and then chant sabbe satta suki huntu. So it was a beautiful experience uh, at the end of the meditation, at the end of the uh, uh, chanting. It was such a wonderful vibrations created in the home. Mm -hmm. And then we feel, we feel like, you know, safe. We feel all the anxiety level got reduced. And then that's five minutes every day brings a beautiful peace in our mind. And we feel like, yes, uh, we def definitely able to face this challenging situation in May 2021, especially when everybody got uh, really, really uh, trapped in that fear in the COVID situation. So that was a beautiful experience. And then coming to the context of today's chapter, Happy Householder, I really feel that uh, uh, this is something uh, Baba Sahib has given a huge importance, a prime importance, how Dhamma can bring happiness to a householder. And the most important things, I really feel the verse number six, the happiness of freedom from debt. Mm. I think everybody in today's world is like uh, trapped in a uh, home loan, car loan, they have credit card loan, they have personal loan. And then, oh, they're like all the time trapped. And especially in India, mm. bank used to call, oh, do you want a personal loan? Do you want this loan? Do you want that loan or something? And people like really get trapped. Mm -hmm. So this is a beautiful way that this is a freedom from debt and wonderful thought Baba Sahib said, I owe no man anything. Mm -hmm. I owe no debt at all. And that brings a great happiness. I, I, I really feel that this is a practical way. This is, a, this is the 21st century. Baba Sahib has put that freedom from debt is brings a real happiness. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then also the sharing, you know, the sharing our our wealth, sharing our wealth in terms of charity, sharing our wealth to our bhikkhu and then dhammadana. That is also bring a huge, uh, like highest happiness, I can say. That experience is, I can say, we cannot express that happiness in terms of words if we like, you know, share our, our wealth to the dhammadana. And daughter may be better than a son. I, I, this is like you know very practical again because uh, in 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 our office, whenever we like you know work with the with the female, the females are really better. They are like you know very intellectual, very knowledgeable, and they can handle so beautifully all the tasks and the projects. If like you know we the two three men are there and two females are there and two females are so much intelligent. Uh, so they have that knowledge, they have that uh, capacity to handle multitasking. The male cannot do the multitasking so efficiently, but female are able to do that multitasking in today's world. So they are so talented, so knowledgeable. So yes, daughter may be better than a son. Uh, so yeah, and then a beautiful relationship with a husband and wife, because if there is a dhamma, as you said, Mange, sir, that if there is a dhamma between husband, husband and wife, then definitely the relationship will be beautiful because even if there is some, you know, anger, even if there is a, some, you know, some sort of a challenges, 
but then if there is a dhamma if there is a panchashil in between these two people husband and wife mm -hmm. that will bring a beautiful happiest and more 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 i can say energetic relationship between these two people so yes this really fits into today's modern world thank you yeah uh, let's see, see the point about debt and you you said rightly that you know the 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 humanity these days is caught in a debt and all sort of uh, what is called the uh, you know the payments that people have to made you know their lives are like caught in the wave of debt on in the in the wave of emis isn't it and sometimes we spread uh, our 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 uh, you know uh, expenses more than what we have today and you know that brings me to a very important point that baba ambedkar's very favorite words in the dhammapada uh, santushti param dhanam so you know santushti is of course the contentment or being happy in 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 the given situation is the real wealth isn't it what is contentment you know if we and you know that brings us to the uh, discussion of the buddha before he became the buddha with the 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 the, the, the king bimbisar where the bimbisar offers buddha the kingdom the house and everything and the buddha says that the purpose of uh, house is to protect oneself from the from the climate around the purpose of the bed is to take rest because we cannot stand all the time you know so this 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 whole setting around us is made for us not to become you know ex experience the pain of of being uh, you know of, of standing all the time or sitting all the time we need to lie sometimes we need an abode that doesn't mean that you know we make everything uh, as a means of happiness you know sometimes something can be thought uh, thought in the way that they provide us the satisfaction isn't it so you know as it is said that even if you have 100 beds but if you cannot sleep what is the use of the bed you know uh, if we have 100 houses but we are not happy what is the purpose of so many houses so you know that brings us to a very important theme in the buddhism is about the contentment and if we we if we that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be earn money we should we should as buddha says that we should earn money by righteous ways but you know uh, you know sometimes we we earn more than you know uh, what we need to live a satisfactory life isn't it sometimes our needs are so few you know you, you we, we might not need 10 rooms house we might be just happy with two rooms house and in the, you know that later that baba sambed has written where this gatha is where he says that i was never afraid of the ups and downs in my life you know he says that if you know he has lived a life of poverty he said that you know when i had nothing i used to think about the people who had nothing at all you know at least i have a roof to cover my head isn't it? That's what Baba Sambhar is saying, you know. So, you, we always think in terms of, you know, what is the most important thing for our lives? You know, whether to have a big, big houses, is that our priority? Or, you know, is to have, a, 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 you know, house that is, that makes us content and, you know, whatever money we have, whether we can share, we can, you see what I'm saying? So, you know, we need a, you know, paradigm shift in the way we think about the wealth in uh, the way the way we think about our lives and you know cut the debts because the debts are going to trap us isn't it the debts are not going to make us free human beings the debts are not going to let us live the way we want our lives lives to be lived and i think that's what we have to think through you know that's what we have to bring it into our lives so thank you sheshank for making that point that's a very important point i think thank you sir so if there is nothing uh on your mind today, then I think we will end our class here. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much for joining in today and uh, see you next week. Jai Bhim Namo Jai Bhim. Jai Bhim.